Hey there drone fans, Rick here again from Drone Valley. This is my first vlog of 2020 and so much has happened in the last couple of weeks that I couldn't wait to sit down and start talking about it. Now some of these things are incredibly exciting while others honestly are terrifying and I'll give you my thoughts on all these topics in a minute but just know that we're working on a batch of clips that we're going to be posting on the channel over the next couple of weeks that go into a lot more detail about the technology and the legislative changes proposed by the FAA because I think both of those areas are incredibly interesting so if you're curious about any of those topics make sure you stay tuned to the channel and watch for those clips being posted. Now, also, I want to encourage you to comment because especially around the FAA legislation, I've got a few things in the works where I want to respond to that in a big way and I've got a call to action coming up where I think you can help with that because the public comment section is open right now. It's kind of interesting they snuck that through on New Year's Eve, but the uh, public section is open right now so you can comment on that up until March 3rd. I encourage everybody out there that watches this channel to go to that website and I'll put a link below and comment on that legislative change because I'll get into it in a minute because I like to start off with good news and that's terribly bad news. I will comment that I think that that's a really bad thing. And I'm coming out publicly and saying that. I'm sure that's not a surprise to you guys. But I think the way they're implementing that is very draconian in so many ways. And I'm going to talk about that second. But I, I can't stop myself because I'm so upset about that. But let's talk about the good news first. All right. So there's been a bunch of drones released in the last couple of weeks. Actually, four drones have hit the market. DJI is kind of quiet right now. So maybe we'll see something coming from them very soon. But two of the drones were released before CES and two of them were announced at CES. The two that came out before CES were the Skydio 2, which I've talked about on the channel before. I've got that. I've been flying it. I've got a lot of clips coming that'll show you how that quad works. I think it's a really interesting quad because they built this sort of follow quad that's incredibly intelligent. It's got artificial intelligence and neural networks built into it and its purpose in life is to find you and follow you wherever you go. So if I'm in the woods like this and I'm going to fly it around here in a little bit, I'm going to duck behind these trees and in and out of these trees and that drone will avoid the trees and follow me. So I think it's a brilliant drone. I also think it's a new class of drone and I've said that before. It's disruptive technology that all the other drones do a really good job of crash avoidance. It's not the same thing as autonomous flight. Autonomous flight is the drone has to make a decision based on its environment where it's going to go to follow you. Its only purpose again is to follow you through this complex environment and that Skydio 2 from all the testing I've done is outstanding in following you. Now the other drone that was released before CES was from a company called Zero Zero Robotics. It's a V-Copter. Now what's interesting about this one to me and I have one on order the minute they release them and ship it to me I'll be doing reviews on it but the v-copter is a two-blade drone so I guess it's a a bicopter not a quad or a, a pentacopter it's a it's a it's a bicopter which is an interesting concept but by tilting those blades in different directions they can fly around I'm very very interested in this technology because the IMU's got to be different the balancing's got to be different the weight distribution so there's a lot going on inside that drone as an engineer I can't wait to get my hands on it and play with it so the v-copter or something will definitely be going into depth on reviews on the channel so stay tuned for that now the two that were announced at CES one of them I was lucky enough to get sort of an NDA on which was the Evo 2 from Wattel, which is a phenomenal drone. And I've raved about it already in a couple of clips, and I've got a lot more clips coming on that. We're finishing up on a couple where we did flight characteristics and showed it against the Mavic and a couple of other products out there. Um, I think they've really nailed it with this drone. This thing is beautiful. It's got a swappable camera. It'll fly 5.5 miles. It'll be up in the air for 40 minutes. I've done some testing against that. I've gotten a solid 33, 35 minutes of flight time out of it, which I think is phenomenal. Um, and that's landing with like 15% left of the battery. But I love that swappable gimbal. And I know I've raved about that before but what I'm buying is one flying platform that's extensible which means I can keep that for three four five years and just whatever camera comes out maybe it's a camera with um, optical zoom or something on it that I can pop in there or a 360 or a thermal I think that's a brilliant concept so I think what they've done with that just like what Skydio has done with the autonomous flight is they've set a new standard for all the drone manufacturers to pay attention to I wouldn't be shocked if you see the new Mavic product have much better autonomous flight and probably a swappable camera so I know I'm going on a limb there but again we don't know what the Mavic's going to look like all right so that's the Evo 2 I think it's a fantastic drone and again stay tuned to the channel because I'm going to be flying that thing like nuts over the next couple of weeks. I've already flown it for three weeks and uh, I just love it. The other product that was announced at CES was the X-Dynamics Evolve 2. Now I had the Evolve 1, I've done some reviews on it and I know the market is kind of split on that. The original Evolve um, was really built for cinematographers and a lot of drone guys like me that are hobbyists looked at it and said man that price point is way up there but if you're a cinematographer and you're filming professionally that drone is right in your sweet spot because they've tweaked it to give you a swappable camera so you can put a bunch of different cameras on it and you can also control it a little smoothly so it's more cinematic when it's flying than the other drones and it has a lot to do with the ESCs and the way they've tuned it but that drone in the air 
is buttery smooth. It's just a sexy flight when you're up in the air. It looks like a Hollywood movie when you're flying that thing. It's just beautiful. So the Evolve 2, they've actually taken it to the next level. So they're putting a four-thirds camera on it. They've extended the distance, extended the flight time. And our good friends from X Dynamics are supposed to be sending us one for review on the channel. So if you guys are watching this clip, make sure you get it in the mail really quick so I can get it up in the air and, and start doing some reviews of it. So those are the four drones. Again, DJI's been quiet. Uh, our good friends over at Parrot, they've been sort of updating that airframe as they went. Uh, the unique folks have not really talked a lot about drones lately. I know they're doing a lot of stuff in the commercial space, so maybe that's where they're heading. We'll have to see. Okay, before I get to the terrifying part of this vlog, I did want to talk about a few new Drone Valley products that we just released in case you missed them. Now, the way we work is when we're out flying, typically in environments like this, if we find something about the drone that we can improve, making it a little bit safer, a little bit more fun, maybe a little easier to use, we'll sit down, put our heads together, we'll develop a product, and then we'll release it as a Drone Valley product. And we've done that for other quads before. We've got a lot of Mavic Mini parts and a bunch of Mavic 2 parts, and we've got some Evo 2 parts coming. Well, the last couple of months, we've been focusing on the Skydio 2 drone because it's brand new, and there's some things that you're probably going to want in the field that we can help you with. So the first thing we released was this two-port car charger. It's a 45-watt car charger. It's one of the few car chargers that supports both PD, power delivery and QC3 uh, charging capability. So it means it can quick charge your devices. So this works really well with the new Skydio. So if you sit the Skydio with the battery in it on your passenger seat, you plug that USB-C cable into the charger, it'll fast charge that Skydio. Not a lot of car chargers will do that. In addition to that, it's got a full-size USB-A on it that'll charge any QC compatible device. So if you've got any other Android device out there that you have to charge or any QC compatible device, plug it into there and you can charge that device. So it's really unique in the space. Again, a 45 watt car charger is pretty, pretty rare out there. Most of the car chargers are five volts and they're really low amperage and you can't charge your Skydio drone with it. So this one will charge your Skydio, it'll charge your smart control, it'll fast charge your Mavic Mini if you've got one of those. We're just really are proud of this product. In addition to that, we've released uh, a charging cable for the Skydio as well. Now this is a triple head cable. It's got three USB-C connections on it. And what's unique about that is you can use it to charge the Skydio beacon, the Skydio remote, and the third USB-C you can use to charge your phone. You're thinking, well, what if I don't have a USB-C connection on my phone, Rick? I'm using an iPhone or I'm using an older Android phone. Well, we thought of that and we included connections that convert that third USB-C to micro USB and to a lightning connector for your iPhone. So you can charge any phone or device you've got out there. If it's a tablet, you can charge that as well. And then if you're thinking, well, gee, Rick, that's a USB-A in the one and I can't plug that into my Skydio charger that I've got at home, so it's useless for me. Well, again, we thought of that, so we've included a female USB-A to a male USB-C, so you can plug this into the USB-A end, plug it into your Skydio charger, and still charge your beacon and all the other stuff, so it works pretty well. Then the last thing we came out with was, I talked about this when I first did the overview of the Skydio 2, I'm worried about that charging port in the back, because if you're flying that horizontally, all the dirt and debris that's falling out of these trees, or if there's mist from rain and things, are going to work their way down into that, that little hole in the back, and it's going to get on the printed circuit board and cause you trouble over time. So we developed these what we're calling charger port covers, and they're full metal jackets. They're the exact color, or pretty close to the color of what the Skydio looks like. Now, I know you can use rubber ones. I've had people say, oh, I'll go on Amazon and I'll buy a bag for a dollar and I'll get 10 of them. I tested a lot of the rubber ones, and what I found was they work okay for a couple of flights, but over time, putting them in, pulling them out, putting them in, they get worn and then they start popping out when you're flying and the whole point of having it in there is to protect that port. So this metal one will sit in there, it matches your drone, it's not popping out when you're flying and they're not that expensive. I think we put two of them together for like eight bucks which is pretty good for metal connectors. If you check these anywhere out there you're gonna find they're a lot more expensive than that. And the cool part is we made them special. We had them designed specially to match that Skydio color. So that's all I wanted to talk about today but if you're a Skydio fan these are things you're probably gonna to wanna to look at. All right, let's get into the bad news. So recently, actually, ironically for me, uh, I was having a really good New Year's Eve, only to find out that FAA came out with the legislative changes that they're proposing for the hobby. And I say ironically because I was in such a good mood about drones. I was talking to a lot of friends at the party about it, and we were all going to go out and fly the next day. I wake up and I read the legislative changes they've proposed. Now, we've kind of known these things were coming. If you listen to the working group or read any of the details that were coming out of those working groups, it seemed like we were heading in this direction. I really, honestly, had no idea they were going to go this far. I thought they were going to take a couple of steps. What they've done is basically started up the engines and driven all the way down the road. So what we're looking at, quite honestly, is a change that, in my opinion, will pretty much end hobby flying. And I know that's a dramatic statement to make, but when you look at the rules they're proposing, if you're a hobby flyer, your drone has to identify its serial number and its physical position in 3D space, its coordinates, 24 by 7. So if you're flying, it's got to be broadcasting that. If you're a hobby flyer, in addition to that, your controller needs to talk to the internet to pass that information along. So second by second, you've now got to contact some third party to tell them where the controller is and where the drone is in real time. 
that's an expensive proposition. Now, I have a lot of thoughts on this, and I have a couple of proposals that would have been, I think, easier to implement that wouldn't have put the burden on the hobbyist. But as a hobbyist flyer, when you think about that, even if you find a drone that can do that, and there are a lot of drones out there that can do that today over Wi-Fi, the controller's not set up to have a SIM connection to the network. Now, you can use your phone, and you can probably tether to the phone and do a SIM connection there, but just think about that for a second. You've got the expense of the drone if you don't have one that can do that today, in addition to which, you're gonna have a very expensive plan to make that connection, some kind of uh, you know broadband plan that'll let you connect to the internet to actually transmit that data on a regular basis. And I don't get it, I just don't understand it. Now, if you don't wanna do that, you can still fly your hobbyist drone within 400 feet of you in a horizontal fashion up to 400 feet above you. So a bubble around you of 400 feet. But even in that circumstance, the drone still has to broadcast its serial number and its location. So that's not as bad, but it's still 400 feet is, you know, I fly visual line of sight for me is a couple thousand feet, probably in a good day in a clear area. 400 feet is going to really limit my flight. If you're not happy with that one, the final is you fly at an AMA field. So you're limited to an AMA field, and again, those same restrictions are in play there, 400 feet, 400 feet up. So to me, I just don't know what they're thinking there. I, I totally agree that there needs to be some kind of identification system out there. And you're probably thinking, where is all this coming from? Is it a big government thing? I don't think it's a big government thing. I think what you've got, as in most times in life when these things happen, is you've got commercial interests on the one side that have a really good lobbying group, and I'll talk about them in a minute, that are talking to the FAA, and they're, they're playing the game of we want to fly commercially. Forget that we're going to deliver packages. That's a small part of what we want to do. What we really care about is saving lives. So we're going to deliver blood. We're going to deliver drugs. We're going to save lives by putting commercial drones up in the air. And I, I believe that's true. I do. But I also believe that that commercial interest, that side of the house that wants to deliver packages and eliminate people driving cars around because it's more cost effective to put a drone up and send it to your house than put a UPS driver in a truck and have him come to your house. I, I don't, you're commercial. You should be taking the burden of this on. I think it's very unfair that they're putting the burden of this legislation on the hobbyists because honestly, we were there first. Our purview is from ground to 400 feet. That's been the hobbyist space. So if you're gonna come into the commercial environment and start flying commercially, why don't you fly in the commercial airspace above 400 feet? The planes are already up there. That's where the commercial activities are going on. Why would you have to come down into the hobbyist space to sort of make that, uh, make that a bigger deal for me? And also, I'm thinking, if you're a commercial operator, you're entering the market, isn't the burden on you to sort of prevent your drones from running into me? Why are you making me responsible for letting you know where I am so you're not gonna collide with me? If you're a commercial operator and you're gonna make millions and millions of dollars, they're predicting it's gonna be a billion dollar industry or multi-billion dollar industry in 10 years, you guys have the burden of producing a drone that's not gonna run into a hobbyist drone that's flying under 400 feet. That just makes sense to me because the analogy I'm looking at, I don't know if you know this or not, but Tesla's working on self-driving cars, right? They already do it already in some of their models today, but their big push is gonna be in trucks. They wanna get into the commercial truck space because when you think about truck drivers that have to drive, they have limitations on how far and how long and when they have to sleep, when they have to be off the road. Well, that's wasteful for the trucking company. They really want a truck to be on the road 24 by seven if possible. If you have an autonomous truck that can drive from here to Los Angeles without stopping, that's a really cost-effective way to go. So Tesla and other companies are working on self-driving trucks, right? Which I think is a great thing. But if you're gonna develop that truck and put it on public highways, you better make darn sure that you've got the artificial intelligence in that truck and the systems that detect cars around you so you're not driving guys like me off the road, right? That's the burden that they're putting on those self-driving cars. Why is it any different for autonomous drones? Why, why are the drones some kind of special case where the commercial drones get to say, well, look, we're going to fly up here. And if a hobbyist is around, we want you to identify where you are. And you want, we want to make sure that you know that we're coming. Like that to me is just nonsense. So I've got some really hard thoughts on this and I'm going to spend time because I'm, I'm rambling a little bit here because I'm so upset about this, but I've got a clip coming where I'm going to explain what I think would have been a better approach. And I actually have three different suggestions on where they could completely imp implement it today without major changes to the hobby industry. I think DJI, I know I'm a fan of DJI technology, but I think DJI has done a wonderful job of showing them that today with the technology that's on the market, they can identify where that drone is. That, that, that would be okay. I don't have any problems. I totally understand they have to know their drones up in the air. I don't like the fact that they want to know where I am 24 by seven. It's like I've got an ankle monitor on me, like I'm under house arrest or something. And, and there isn't any hobby out there that requires that kind of identification and tracking. So it's just lost on me. But anyway, I have three suggestions that would use, I think the DJI technology that's out there today and they've already demonstrated it to sort of help this problem go away for us as hobbyists but I think we really need to be one voice when we get in touch with the FAA on that site. And again, I'll recommend you go on there up until March 3rd. You can make those comments public. When you post your comments, think about them. 
don't be angry because they're going to read them and they're going to dismiss you immediately if you're angry. So think about it. Be contemplative and write something that's passionate but it's logical. Don't just start cursing at them. It's not going to solve any problems, but think about it. And then before you post it, read it a couple of times to make sure the spelling's right and everything's good with the grammar and then post it. And I think as a voice, if all of us stand up and say, look, we're hobbyists, we're citizens, we pay taxes. The airspace is as much ours as it is a commercial interests. So why are you leaning in the space of commercial interests? I get that they want to fly, probably going to save lives. It's going to get packages to my house faster, but figure out a way to make those guys responsible for the costs and burden of that. Don't put it on the hobbyists. And that's how I'm going to approach it. But stay tuned to the channel because I'm going to go into much more detail about the actual rules that are proposed right now and three of the suggestions that I've got that I think are reasonable suggestions to help them sort of move this along. So that's all I wanted to talk about that. Man, am I upset about this. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about, which is good news. I like to end on a good note. We had our 12 days of Drone Valley Christmas over the last couple of weeks, and I know you guys are anxious to hear about the winners, but the honest truth is, once somebody wins that contest, I have to send them an email. They have to read the email. They have to get back to me with their address so that I know they're okay with me sending the package to them. And you're not going to believe this, but I sent out all those emails already, and in some cases, I've sent them out twice, three times, four times and I had to move on. I just can't wait for somebody to get back to me because it's probably in their spam folder. So what I had to do is actually pick another winner, notify them. So I've been working through that over the last couple of weeks. And the honest answer is if you've won something, you'll know you've won something. If you, ha if you haven't got an email from me, you didn't win anything yet, but I have a clip coming. Once I hear from the last two guys that haven't gotten back to me yet, I'll put a clip together. I'll announce all the winners and everybody will know what's going on. Now, having said that, we had such a good response over Christmas with this, and I felt so good giving those prizes away that we're going to continue it. So probably once a month, I'm going to run a contest on the channel where I'm going to pick something cool that we're reviewing or somebody sent us for review, and we're going to give that away. So if you're a fan of those kind of giveaways, stay tuned to the channel because we're going to have a lot more opportunities this year throughout 2020 to win stuff on the channel. And I don't want to do that to seem like we're trying to get subscribers. It's just we're really lucky that we have manufacturers that work with us, and I can't fly everything we get. So I'm going to give a lot of that stuff back to the community because nothing makes me happier then hearing somebody for the first time send me an email and say, Rick, I bought a drone. I watched your channel. I bought a drone. I put it up and life is good. That's all I care about. So the more people I can make happy and introduce to this hobby, the better I feel. So that's pretty much it. And that's all I really had today. So thanks all for watching. Sorry I got a little rambunctious there with the FAA stuff, but I'm sure you guys are as frustrated as I am by these rules. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to me that they would change it that dramatically and only give us a couple of months to respond. It just seems pretty crazy. But anyway, Things are good. I hope you guys are getting a lot of flight times. And until next time, happy flying.